What are the classics? The story of Western civilization. Sometime in the 8th or 7th centuries before Christ, conventionally taken as the dawn of classical antiquity, there was a man who began writing all the poetry he can. I'm just kidding. We will not be reciting this in poetry. He set out to learn the tales of his tribe's people on the nearby islands and olive groves, on what made them unique, but at the same time made them similar. Maybe both islands would have recollection and ritual towards Poseidon, but only one would make a physical offering. This being besides the point, his writing is one of the reasons so many people still know the Greek gods and their history today. This man was Homer, of Ionia. An island in the seas west of Greece. Said to be blind and perhaps illiterate, his works were in the beginning passed down by oral tradition, and memorized by the aid of rhyme and rhythm. First publishing his epic sometime in the 8th or 7th centuries BC, and written in dactylic hexameter, a dactyl being a foot in poetic meter, and hexameter meaning more or less six syllables depending on which words you stretch. This would make the tales told by Homer, as old and forgotten in history and time to the Greeks of Plato's day, as the tales of King Arthur, and the Knights of the Round Table are to us today. Yet while the last 200 years have seen progress unprecedented in history, unless you believe in Atlantis or something as described by Plato. Just as the last mammoths roamed the frozen prairies of the north when ancient Egyptians were already irrigating towns, while cultivating creative ideas such as religion, empires, and monuments. History has no scale, no mercy, and no precedent. But it does have patterns. I've dedicated the last six years of my life to analyzing and interpreting those patterns. Hello, and welcome, to the Block Bard Classics. Over the years we've had the pleasure of teaching antiquity to hundreds of thousands of brilliant and inquisitive minds like yours. By bringing the classics to life online through social media. What are the classics? And why are they so important to us today? Are they even still relevant today? What can we learn from these stories told thousands of years ago? These are the questions we will discuss over the following video. What are the classics? Plus historical examples of influence. If you are watching this video from anywhere on earth with an internet connection right now, there is a good chance you have heard of demigods and gorgons such as Hercules and Medusa. Olympians and Titans like Zeus the god of lightning, and Atlas, he who was condemned to forever hold up the heavens on his back. Or maybe you are more familiar with these tales and remember. With good reason, the exact tales and tellings that led to the stories we are left with today. Much can be learned from the study of the reactivity of mankind. Everything from the outcomes of chaos, and economies of war, to the importance that a single written text, philosophy or belief, has on its people. You've probably heard war stories. Either in movies, literature, or in rare cases, life where someone conjures up power from unknown sources they never previously knew how to harness, or even existed. This is the power of a story. This is why the classics are still so relevant today. And to my work as an advertiser in the Blockbard writing service aside from my classical studies. I'm going to make another guess and assume if you're a millennial watching this video on YouTube, there's a good chance you have also seen Space Jam. Remember the part where Daffy Duck is giving water to people called Super Juice or something similar? It definitely wasn't Super Juice but you get the idea. That's the power again of a simple story, illustrated as a problem solver to the cartoon's very climax. 
the whole tune squad is dogging out, when, comes to save the day, classical principles, yay. And I'm not talking about the placebo effect. While that plays its part for sure, I more so mean to represent and bring to light the meaningful archetypes and paradigms of a well-told tale, and exactly how much they can affect a group or tribe or people. But these are only the hypotheses of a copywriter and self-made social scientist. I don't know what you're going to buy or email, or what you've watched recently from any data, like do most IT companies including, but not to point fingers. Google, Netflix, or Facebook. Surprising as it is that the culture the West should baptize would start in the rocky islands and mountains of Greece where in my opinion it would be one of history's hardest places to establish a civilization, let alone a culture that counts on for near 3,000 years. But history does not seem to agree with me. It was here the Greeks found themselves worshipping the same gods as their neighbors just across the isles, which brought a sense of peace and belonging, which can lead to higher forms of education as less people are warring and farming and can focus on progressing skills. Not that farming and war are not skills, quite the contrary, just that they do not move people toward the cultivation of the sciences, instead hitting on the competition of species, and inventing things like canned food, or grain stores. Both invented in, and because of war. Including unfortunate for some, better war machines but more fortunately more productive farming methods, as the canning and preservative industry took off in both world wars. However was was not invented in times of war were things like university, democracy, literature, and theater. Do you really think Homer could have written anything more than a ten-page manuscript before paper and ink was invented on stone tablets if there were often enemies raiding his island? Of course he still writes about war. Because he knows the power of a story. Something Plato wrote about almost 2500 years before the Industrial Revolution saw it happen with scale in the late 19th and early 20th century. A prediction unprecedented if you ask me, which is why we must consider some of Plato's other ideas to be worthy of their weight in modernity. Plato one of history's most revered philosophers, calls this the theory of specialization, which we will delve deeper into later in the series. There was no doubt internal war, though I wouldn't say civil, as society was merely still being established. And there had to have been less war than places nearby otherwise they would have been the ones to pass down their stories before they died or were uprooted by another people, and not the Greeks regarding the Olympian gods like Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, one thing stands out above everything else when compared directly to other religions, cultures, and beliefs. And that is that the Greek gods are far more human, and thus subject to our flaws than other gods we see in other religions. And that must mean to us, a similar sense of familiarity that it did our island-dwelling ancient ancestors. The first classic. Admired for almost three millennia, Homer's ultimate epic, the Iliad, along with its successor, the Odyssey, was memorized by poets across the lands of Greece as was the Bible in later times. The ancient Greeks themselves held it as the most important piece of literature as well as the cornerstone of their culture and thus, civilization. By force of its insurmountable epicness, the Iliad, as it was one of the very first epics, sets the standard for the entire definition of the word. A long narrative poem in elevated style recounting the deeds of a legendary or historical hero. To say these deeds haven't shaped Western civilization in everything from the action films we watch, to the stories we tell each other on lunch break, would be doing history a great disservice. 
These stories contained in the Homeric epic aroused the very same feeling one gets when watching their favorite superhero movie mixed with the glorious vocals of a church choir preaching ancient scripture alike if not one far greater when those exposed as readers' senses are less desensitized to emotional media, entertainment, and spirituality of lesser quality on a daily basis. What then, might we define as a hero in terms that should do justice to those the ancient Greeks, whom we seek to so greatly venerate and deconstruct in every study? In ancient Greek myth, heroes were not gods, and though my Greek is as fluent as a two-year-old native speakers, even polyglots with full fluency find dissecting the connotations and true definitions of ancient Greek words, still used today in their English form, far from any accurate ancestral meaning. Hero today does not evoke the same significance it did in ancient Greece. Mayhaps it's overused, it definitely carried more weight for them yesterday than it does for us today. Heroes were human, endowed with superhuman abilities and descended from the immortal gods themselves. There is much precision but little accuracy when it comes to the study of ancient civilizations of the remote past. One of the main characters is Achilles, more commonly known as Achilles in English tradition. This is the greatest hero in the Iliad, the son of Thetais, a sea goddess and leader of the fifteen Iliads. Because of a prophecy that she was destined to bear a son greater than his father, Zeus had her marry a mortal man Pleus. It is clear in the epic, however, that the father of Achilles is mortal, and that the greatest of heroes must therefore be mortal as well. So also with all the ancient Greek stories of the heroes, even though they are all descended in some way or another from the gods, however many generations removed, heroes are still mortals, and as such, are subject to death the same as the rest of us. No matter the manliness of immortals you'll find in a family tree, the introduction, inclusion, or rather intrusion of even a single mortal will make all of the successive descendants mortal. Mortality, and not immortality, is the dominant gene. In some stories, true, the gods themselves can bring it about that the hero becomes miraculously restored to life after death, a life of immortality. The story of Hercules, who had been sired by Zeus, the chief of all the gods, is perhaps the most celebrated instance. But even here, we see the hero must first die. It is only after the most excruciating pains, culminating in his death at the funeral pyre on the peak of Mount Eta, that Hercules is at long last admitted to the company of immortals on Mount Olympus. Or in the Disney version where Hades assigns his minions, pain and panic, to turn Hercules mortal, then kill him. The two decide to tell Hades that they killed Hercules, but figured leaving him on earth as a mortal was enough to keep him from interfering in Hades' vengeful plot. Since Hercules is almost completely mortal, he cannot return to Mount Olympus. The point being that the hero can be immortalized, but only by the gods. This is a metaphor for people who, remembered long after their death, and affecting the lives of those that live after them, might be considered immortal. However, an underlying and archetypal statement remains throughout the epic's entirety. The fundamental fact, painful to both Achilles and his future fans reading, that the hero is by nature mortal. The Odyssey extends further in its narrative about immortalization in another great metaphor. The epic makes it clear that Odysseus will have to die on his journey, even if it happens in a prophecy, beyond the framework of the surface narrative. Which is almost a humorous twist of an ending contained in a book as serious as the Odyssey. Wherein Odysseus dies such a trivial death after facing gods, which is, monsters, 
and the House of Hades, only to return unscathed every time. When Calypso tells Odysseus that he can leave her island, Odysseus, instead of accepting immortality, rejects immortality because he knows the nature of man is to live and die, and like only the most human of mortals Odysseus simply wants to return home to Ithaca to see his wife and son. The gods, however, are altogether exempt from this pain from death. Perhaps seeing it as a sign of mortality, or humanness, this can be seen when the god Ares goes through the mortal feelings of death, and its disparity from the reckless lives one all too likely lives as an immortal. After he's taken off guard and wounded by Diomedes in book V of the Iliad. Amid war, Ares sees only Diomedes astride his chariot. The god of war throws his spear like only a god could, when interrupted by third parties of spiritual strife and rivalry, as is often the case in these epics. Athena guides its imperfect aim wayward, so too guiding Diomedes' retaliation toss forward. Then the god screams a scream only the voice of ten thousand men could scream, and flees away. This can almost be seen as a touch of humor, though it is not quite the irony we see on the scale of Odysseus' journey and Joseph Campbell-like come around in the Odysseys have a predictable yet preposterous ending. In the Greek world of epic, death is only taken dead seriously by humans. Ancient writers after Homer, even the rather austere Greek historian Thucydides, 5th century BC, assume the historicity regarding much of the Iliad's content and subject matter. Likewise, Alexander the Great 356, 323 BC seems to have been driven by these epics some 400 years after the origin, claiming his childhood and lifelong hero as Achilles. Plutarch, 45-120 Anna Domini, tells most delightfully how Alexander slept with, under his pillow at night, a dagger alongside a copy of Homer's Iliad. This particular copy had been annotated by Alexander's former tutor, the famous philosopher Aristotle, who was taught by Plato, who was in turn taught by Socrates. One can only speculate how much value that single copy of the book could hold today had it only been kept. In the Roman world, the poet Virgil, 70-19 BC, set out to write an epic poem about the origins of Rome from the ashes of Troy. His poem, called the Aeneid, after Aeneas, an original Trojan founder of Rome, is written in Latin but is heavily reliant if not entirely based off of, or on, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. We know it today for its most enduring symbol, the Trojan horse. And if you don't, spoiler alert, one of the messages there might be, not to take sketchy gifts from your friends. But what the Iliad was truly about, not just between the pages, but between the words, wasn't the scene where they, thinking the Greeks had abandoned their siege, wield this great gift to the gods. More specifically Poseidon. He was a pretty big deal around Troy that would in turn send them, and their beloved city, too, for the first, and last time, finally dying with their deities. No. It wasn't even Prince Parius begrudging of Helen of Sparta, later changing to Helen of Troy or the sappy love story the poets so love, the romance that broke a bond between nations, or the face that set sail one thousand ships. As impressive as every minuscule detail is in this ancient epic, and as influential as having an entire sub-study of history, culture, and philosophy, named after a woman who didn't do much more than leave her husband and king is. The biggest highlight from Homer's 15,693 line, 24 book poem is the scene between Achilles and Priam, wherein he Priam, 
under the cover of darkness dressed in rags and robes, sneaks into the Greek's beachhead, and into Achilles' tent, right after Achilles had. Enraged after hearing his lover and cousin, don't ask me, had been slain, slaughtered Hector. His heir, eldest, and bravest boy. Before dragging his still quivering body behind his chariot by his ankles. Priam then pleads with Achilles to take his son's body home for proper burial. What many people do not realize until they actually read the books is that the Iliad ends before Achilles dies, and before the Trojan horse. Told as a war song between the Argives, citizens of Argos, and the gods. Who, due to translation, find themselves depicted in their Roman names, rather than their more familiar and anglicized Greek versions. Cronos is Saturn. Poseidon, Neptune. Hades is Pluto, Hera is Juno, Athena is Minerva, and so on. Which makes things slightly more confusing at first. Quote. Italian naval archaeologist Francesco Taboni has claimed that the Trojan horse was actually a boat, not a horse. Taboni's argument concerns the symbol of the 5,000-year-old ancient city of Troy, the site of which is located in the present-day village of Tipfike, in the northwestern province of Sanargale. The head of the Troy excavations, Professor Rooster Maslin, says Taboni's claims will not change the legend of the Trojan horse, which has fascinated people for thousands of years. Here is a quote from Book 8 of his second epic, The Odyssey. For the Trojans themselves had drawn the horse into their fortress, and it stood there while they sat in council round it, and were in three minds as to what they should do. Some were for breaking it up then and there. Others would have it dragged to the top of the rock on which the fortress stood, and then thrown down the precipice. While yet others were for letting it remain as an offering and propitiation for the gods. And this was how they settled it in the end, for the city was doomed when it took in that horse with and which were all the bravest of the Argifs waiting to bring death and destruction on the Trojans. Anon he sang how the sons of the Achans issued from the horse, and sacked the town, breaking out from their ambuscade. He sang how they overran the city hither and thither and ravaged it, and how Ulysses went raging like Mars along with many laus to the house of Diabobus. It was there that the fight raged most furiously, nevertheless by Minerva's help he was victorious. the second classic. If Homer's Iliad was the Hollywood of ancient Greece then his Odyssey was the first box office breaking sequel. The first Tiggy feature film. The first fantasy fiction. The first 3D show. The first drama series. And of course the second action epic. Only it was a poem. The word epic in fact stems from this very form of writing. The form of long narrative poetry which, regarding heroic deeds of unparalleled bravery, courage, and zeal, usually utilizes the dramatic grandiose we see so often spoken in these books. Ilion was the ancient name for the city of Troy. So, Iliad can be translated as the action of Troy or the poem of Troy, or, my personal favorite, a Troy story. As well Odyssey is simply the verbal version of the name Odysseus the Cunning. The main character we find in the Odyssey, which holds to this day a similar meaning to what it once did when it was used upon the islands depicted in this epic series of events. A hazardous journey. This Odyssey is more often known to us and those in entertainment today as the hero's journey. As per Joseph Campbell's straightforward approach to storytelling, used and found amongst and amidst and across every culture. This means your favorite film or book series. If it so happened to have a hero of any kind, which most will, will have been heavily influenced by the work in this here poem. Whether its creators have read it, comprehended and understood it, or even translated a professorial manuscript, or not. It has touched their lives all the same. The Odyssey like the Iliad, was divided into 24 books, corresponding to the 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. The English alphabet, 
having only two more letters, and taking its name and the first of its two members from that of the Gecko lexicon, might be close enough to English, were we angles to disregard our two duplicative consonants altogether. Then again, English is a mere few hundred years old, and but a swaddling baby when sized up on the scales of time against the great poets of the ancient world. A world that cannot nor could not boast a Shakespeare before there was a homo no less than it could discover science without first discovering its unwavering and lawful sibling, mathematics. Odysseus takes what would normally take two weeks to sail from ancient Troy, situated on the western coast of Turkey. Ten years to complete the same journey. Plagued by pro-Trojan, anti-Greek gods like Poseidon, Aphrodite, Apollo, and Athena who would make his voyage home a trip to remember no doubt. Odysseus in mine and the opinions of many, stands the tallest of the heroes in and throughout the ancient epics. Sure, Paris was as princely and comely as they come, and Hector held what might be marveled as the highest heroism. But, in regarding what is the most human, regardless of however inhuman his encounters may have been, remains only the treacherous trails blazed by Odysseus and his crewmen, wherein their foes faced, being gods and all, still managed to surmount the connivory of even the sliced simpleton. We see society's regard for the classics, especially in the humanities, and other artistic industries all over the Western world. From themes in Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and Star Wars, to names and geographical locations, video games, and direct films produced for single stories alone. Modern Culture Famous painters have also drawn inspiration from classical works, like Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo Rembrandt and Raphael, all of which emerged in the Renaissance period where a new culture of Christianity was being born out of the classics, and influenced by artists and poets, more so than the priests, and preachers. Just so were the seemingly unrealistic and problems and gods of the past carved out of community, rather than organization. There is a reason humanity tells so many tales on repeat. That reason? Well it is because they are good, yes. But more so because they resonate with a certain people and behavior pattern. Whether that behavior pattern is good or bad is up for debate. Santa Claus is a noble story, whose end which brings you and your family holiday cheer, seems to justify its own untruth. The story of Cinderella has been recorded across a myriad of cultures for centuries. Only in some cultures, family politics were so severe that the only way Cinderella could have ever escaped her evil stepmother. In a story that's supposed to be believable by its culture at the time of its telling, is of course, well, by murdering her. If you look back we will find the only thing that has led to the unification of ideas and stories across civilization is that. While everyone has had their own way of telling it, they for the most part, interpreted them all the same. Almost every story in which the hero or main character returns to where he begins off, but is a new and improved person can be forthright sequential to Homer's Odyssey. Kenneth Warren 
professor of English at the University of Chicago, agrees. Quote, There's no getting around how foundational Homer's epic has been for storytelling in the West. The Odyssey has provided the architecture for the quest narrative and the template for characterizing male and female virtue in ways that shape, enable, and limit our storytelling habits into the present. David Varno, literary critic, highlights the ingenuity woven throughout the epic poem. The many triumphs of wit and grit on the part of Odysseus and Penelope must have counted for something over the millennia. Counted for something they did indeed. Even someone such as Walt Disney, one of the most accredited creative persons and forward thinkers of our time, found himself retelling the classics. One cartoon pair of gloves at a time. Little Mermaid leaves us little room to deny the fact that King Triton, the Roman remake of Poseidon, and the wonderful sea shanties sung by sea creatures themselves is anything but history made fun for children. The original authorship of Little Mermaid written in 1836 by Danishman Hans Christian Andersen is not exactly written for kids. While she still finds herself increasingly intrigued by humans, her sisters resemble the sirens from many other fan-favorite sea stories. In their obsession with luring and drowning men to the depths of the sea. How Climate Creates Culture A nation's geography shapes its people more than its people shape its geography. Take for example the genetics of East Asians and their tendency to have defined calf muscles acclimated to the rugged regions and terraced terrains they developed in. Or Sub-Saharan Africans' immunity to sunburn and enhanced agility. You'd want to be pretty fast too if you shared your backyard with the world's top predators now wouldn't you? Or the Inuit of the Northern Hemisphere's ability to survive solely off the sea, specifically seal meat. Getting essential nutrients like vitamin C and an array of minerals by eating organs and all. These people had no bread, potatoes, or carbs in general. And today they still have little, but for the most part the average Inuit life expectancy was, and is today the same among human averages. So too, were the island-dwelling peoples of ancient Greece carved by their ways as wayfarers, winemakers, and storytellers. Such storytelling led to the world's first democracy. And the western world's first philosophers, astronomers, and mathematicians. No one alive today really knows if the correct spelling for Kronos is Cretan with a C or Rodian with a K. But what we history folk can all agree on is that the Romans bastardized it all. The Mediterranean Sea, deriving its name from Latin, Medius Middle plus Tira Land was obviously not known as the Mediterranean to the ancient Greeks with Latin having yet to be invented. But its significance in human development and civilization is undeniable. It was here the waters were stable and plenty enough to sustain great cities and all forms of ship making. The Egyptians had highly functioning societies thousands of years before Socrates drank his hemlock. These societies are so old and erased they're still shrouded in mystery, but intrigue us even more for that very reason. What happened in the 1500 year gap between the last pyramid built in 2200 BC and Homer's Iliad in 800 BC? Were humans simply stagnant? Why haven't we any poems from this time? If they were stagnant, why was climate change going crazy? 
We now know about many ice ages and predict past cold spells with stunning accuracy. Were the people super suppressed by perhaps other people? Speculation is key to hypotheses. For how can you expect to understand the answer to a question you haven't yet asked or even specified? In our search for the answer to one question, we often answer another. Heritage and misogyny Let us start off with the Spartans. The revered warrior culture, built from birth for battle. Yes they were built for battle, but had the advantage of having half of their society set from birth to be born as their slaves. It is easy to focus on fighting all day when you have your meals cooked and clothes cleaned for you. Remember how much time we seem to always have as children. Boredom is an adulthood luxury, but a bane nonetheless. Repeated throughout the culture is an obvious and inherent disdain for women almost incumbent, dare I say, in ancient Greek societies. Or even ancient societies as a whole. Incumbent how? This can be another chicken or egg dilemma. Or we can dichotomize it this way. 1. If stories didn't contain such vile acts against women, the women wouldn't see them as acceptable behavior. Examples include being sold to men, being punished for being beautiful, having daughters and wives taken, and a bunch of other Game of Thrones level shit. So then, the men wrote these in an attempt to excuse their own actions and misdeeds against women. Or the latter. 2. If stories didn't contain such vile acts against women, the women wouldn't see them as acceptable behavior. So the men, having seen that life is hard for women, historically speaking, write these tales in a stoic attempt to make them feel like these women had it worse. Thus excusing humanity's actions against women and not their own. Thereby transferring the blame and resolving themselves of all guilt and need to change. I'm not sure which is better. If you think there's a third alternative. A trichotomy. Please share in the comments below. Either way, it isn't until women get a taste for reading and writing their own stories that they attempt to rewrite their own destiny. It all starts with a story. This is why the Catholic Church printed Bibles in only Latin. So as to hold themselves higher than everyone else whose destiny was simply to obey God and not interpret his word. Martin Luther's 95 Theses came out at a time when very few people save for the clergy could read, and in it specifically states that the Bible is the central religious authority, not the people who hold and read it. But the Reformation of 1517 is another episode on its own. For how can you argue with the word of God if you can't even translate his followers' preachings? A quick status of statues, plus gods. I'm sure you've all seen the statues. But what you may not know about said stone structures is that they created a culture of artistry and that everything that is not contemporary to some degree is considered to be classical. This is generalizing because sure, while you still have your neoclassical, which just means new classical, and your renaissance romanticism, and a few others. Culture experts could point out both still attribute themselves directly to classical culture. In the year 8 AD, the Latin poet Ovid set out to create what would be his magnum opus, an epic narrative detailing in verse the Greco Roman realms of myth, lore, spirit, and story.
This epic consisted of 11,995 lines, all of which rhyme, 15 books, and over 250 myths and ancient stories. With this masterpiece the Roman poet Ovid began a new era of poetry, the super epic. His Carmen Perpetum, as he calls it in his opening describes in the simplest sense how one can read this book, and hear it forever in the backs of their minds. Never forgetting its complexity. Never ceasing to contemplate its fortuity or foregoing its necessity in the lives of those to whom it was read. This overflowing anthology of historical epics is taken far from the stories and narratives that seeded her. By Ovid's exaggerating their significance in the old tragical tradition that so often finds its company in Greek literature. But the trick to Ovid's mastery of retelling and poetic translation lay in his comical yet ferocious ability to mimic his character's emotional aspects, and their realities. Brought to life by order. And during the reign of, Augustus, some lengthy time after the death of Caesar. This shows us a more detailed view into the lives of one of the most successful and arguably most revered emperors to rule over Rome. He liked poems. Or art for that matter. And if he didn't, he most definitely saw their significance in his people's everyday lives and culture. Shakespeare and Chaucer can be caught frequenting his works throughout the creation of their own. In one example we have the play of Pyramus and this playing within the play of A Midsummer Night's Dream. A play within a play. And Chaucer's entire approach to poetry can often be boiled down to his Ovidianistically French take on the finer things in life. Both of these late medieval English poets allude their homage to the predecessor poet Ovid. In all their works covering what Ovid and his 11,995 line super epic may have already covered. Writing in English, about stories written in Latin about stories written in Greek, will have you losing things in translation. This is perhaps why universities are ever more moving away from the direct literary texts they seek to teach, and instead resorting to modern interpretations of such texts. This super epic is as it was, when presented in English 300 years ago. The structure used to collect and display these poems in their Alexandrian undertone was taken from Hellenistic poetry styles and placed directly in the hearts of her readers through Ovid's new and personal style of storytelling. Quote, Ovid's relation to the Hellenistic poets was similar to the attitude of the Hellenistic poets themselves to their predecessors. He demonstrated that he had read their versions but that he could still treat the myths in his own way. Karl Galiansky Without a doubt much of the credit of this piece goes to the late John Dryden, 1631-1700, who in his both obvious and apparent passion for poetry translated from an ancient language 40,000 lines of content into Jacobian verse, all the while keeping or rather maintaining the rhymes and their scheme. Dryden himself follows in the tradition of Jacobean modernism after Benjenson. Though using the classics as a template for all of his work, he nonetheless pioneered in all major literary fields. Literary criticism, poetry, drama, translation and satire. In 1666 he published his modern epic charting the heroic reconstruction of the post-Cromwellian state. Months later however, this triumph was somewhat overshadowed by Milton's Paradise Lost. Touching on the deep religious unrest. This suggested that Dryden had not written so pertinently.
Owing to religious issues, Dryden became reclusive in retirement and chose to write translation as a social shield. The object of his art was to capture beauty, poetic beauty. His writing is based more around this aesthetic than any other. Tom Bailey The narratives in this super epic run from passive to perplexing to the voice of gods and the thoughts of mortal men, to the hearts of those characters sometimes even conscious of their presence in a poem. If the context is not enough for the modern mind to ponder, then its delivery could well suit any formidable writer, and draw them away from their place of current to be found walking with the gods of Olympus themselves. What we find throughout the theology of the ancient Greeks is the recurrent theme of gods, misbehaving and lacking such godly virtues as if they were mere men. This is part of what plagued Socrates with discerning the gods as unrealistic and by the Athenian court made to drink the hemlock, much later leading to Christianity. A faith filled with virtues and the god of example. But this is another story. The reason the Greek gods were so at the time realistic is because like any human, but immortal and a god, they could care less about the trivial consequences of mortals. And so, this poem is brimming with the stark and all too real faults of mortals. Yet what is most strange to the modern mind, at least in the West, is the fact that it's the gods themselves partaking in the dramatic indifferences which so seem today to be made for anyone but God. Today we can celebrate the longevity of great ideas in our Western heritage which sparked such events and wonders as the Olympics, democracy, poetry, theatre and drama, the arts, the marathon, cartography, anchors for seafaring, odometers, and many more. Sometime in the 11th century BC, the first sanctuary of Zeus was built in Olympia, with mountain ranges easterly and rivers on the west, the land was home to an abundance of pine, olive, and many other varieties of trees, the fauna too, was just as plentiful. After some centuries of cultural acceleration, the consensus among historians is that the first Olympic event took place in the years 776 BC and have been with us ever since, only ever being disrupted by war said to be made by the sculptor Phidias in the year 435 BC the statue of Zeus situated at Olympia was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Every Olympiad, sculptors and poets alike, would gather to display their arts to potential patrons. The statue was destroyed and lost in 426 Anna Domini under commission and reign of Theodosius who would have been an early Christian emperor of Rome. With Christianity only becoming legal across Europe in 339 Anna Domini under Emperor Constantine, with the Edict of Milan, it would become the official religion of the empire only ten years later. But we will save that for another episode. Undoubtedly, by its ease of access, and inclusion of almost anyone of able body. The sprint race was said to be the first sport introduced to the Olympic Games. Another story from later centuries goes that the Oracle of Delphi spoke to three kings of Greek states, giving them the idea, in order to suppress hostility, and telling them to establish an armistice between nations during the Games. Its incorporation of teamwork competition, commitment, and prosperity, is indeed unprecedented. Just imagine how many translators were needed, and how many citizens went home with new views of the peoples around them. They are just like us. 
they might have said. The endurance of the Olympic stands is testimony today to one of the greatest humanitarian events orchestrated in all of history. Online and through social media, we've been able to reach millions of brilliant minds just like yours, by formatting history's best books, tales, and ancient literature, into digestible pieces of daily content directly to your feed. Or visit www.theblockbard.com. However this is our first YouTube video, and even with all the stock footage we were able to get a hold of, with filming, narrating, script writing and video editing, this still took us several hundred hours to make. And that's not to mention the previous time I spent studying antiquity, all the outstanding expertise of our video production team here at the Block Bard. A special thanks to all of you. And an even more special thanks to you. Our audience who make this kind of work in the end, worthwhile. If you're interested in classical history and cultures, and how their cultivation can help you become a better person, subscribe to the Block Bard's YouTube for more videos coming soon. See you next time.